Hey, Bob. Hey, sir. How are you doing? Hey, how's my background? You can't see anything beyond my background, right? No, no you're good. Good? good. OK. You're good. Hey, guys. Hey, David. Hey, Eugene. <coughs> Welcome, guys. Welcome, uh, Don. We will get rolling here pretty quickly. Oh, there's Delfino. Hey, Delfino. See Delfino's forehead. So very, very good. Um, so, hey, welcome, everybody. We should have uh, Master Smith and a few more join us here in half a second. So uh, we shall get up and running. While we're, uh, um, while we're waiting for, uh, uh, well, we're not waiting for anybody, but while they're joining in and we're getting started, you guys want to start with any uh, specific questions you have so far on anything? <coughs> no? <coughs> okay. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give them the opportunity. <coughs> so, yes, sir. Well, let's, uh, um, any and all questions you have, uh, this is fully interactive. If you have some background noise, just mute yourself out. Uh, there should be a little mute function right there on the um, on your video screen or in, in on the bottom left of your screen, I believe. So if um, if you have anything going on in the background, just uh, mute yourself. Otherwise, everybody's live pretty much the entire time here. Um, uh, set the recording button, Master Over. We are recording. Okay, great. Yeah, we uh, we 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 don't rely on me to do that anymore. It just automatically records. Yeah, I saw Jesse uh, Thornton was on. So, hi, Jesse. Yes, sir. Yeah. But um, anyway, well, let's let's get started because I um, um, again, any and all questions, feel free to chip in at any time because we want to make it uh, 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 completely um, interactive here today, and make sure we, uh, uh, to the greatest extent possible, anyway, don't uh, leave any stone unturned. But um, um, let, let me start with this is you guys should have all gotten a ton of information from us already. Uh, so uh, a couple of the books, um, um, the package of DVDs and CDs. If you haven't gotten that, unless you just got ordered the program last couple of days, you should have that already. Mails out of Wichita, Kansas. And regardless, you should have all the same content on the website. Uh, which the website includes, which the package does not, the complete written transcripts for everything. Uh, so if you will prefer to read it, you've got the full written transcripts. If you learn by listening and reading at the same time or uh, watching and listening to the video and reading at the same time, you have all the different uh, avenues there for you. Uh, what, uh, what I would say is that um, uh, one thing that we like to do uh, with everybody who is uh, is new is schedule a time to talk, learn more about your school, learn more about your problems and opportunities. Uh, Bob Dunn, who's here, raise your hand again, Bob. Hey, uh, guys. Um, his phone number is 720-256-0208. And I will do that again since I just kind of sprung on everybody. Again, the phone number is 720 256 0208. We'll give it to you later as well. Uh, but uh, I would re highly recommend give him a call and let's schedule a time and, and go through your numbers a little bit more, go through your school size uh, goals and objectives a little bit more. And we'd love to see if there's any other ways that we can help you uh, uh, get to the goals and objectives that you have. Uh, I, I've had a number of you that I see already on the, on the meeting today. Uh, asked me about the structure of what we do on an ongoing basis. And there's a website that has that. You probably haven't uh, been sent that link yet. You may be overwhelmed with material, but it's martialartswealth.com forward slash mastermind. M A S R M I N D. So martialartswealth.com forward slash mastermind. And that gives you a, a, a two more bonus videos. And I believe a real complete, thorough understanding of what it is that we do to work with schools on an ongoing basis. And again, we have quite a bit of background noise there. So if, uh, if you have a question, ask. If not, it might be useful to uh, 
to stay muted the, the rest of the time. Um, and uh, what I will try to do when we get uh, a side conversation going, I will do my best to uh, mute them as well if I can figure out who it is. Sounds like somebody has TV radio going on in the background. But uh, Bob, maybe you know where that is. I can't, sir. Maybe it'd be easier just to mute everyone for now, and then we can just unmute ourselves. Uh, well, I'm not sure I can figure out how to do that right now. So <laughs> we, we may have to suffer a little bit. It looks yeah. like it's quieted. There you go. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so, so as we go here, uh, I'm not going to uh, try to hit a bunch of stuff that you guys probably uh, touched upon somewhat. It uh, looks like Lee. Lee, if you're there, can you mute your uh, background noise? Huh. Well, for some reason, it's not letting me mute him. So I don't know. Uh, diplomas. <laughs> yeah, was that you? Yes, that was me. I was looking in your back, the wall behind you. <laughs> oh. Okay. Was that a question? No, that was a compliment. I was like, oh my goodness. I was talking to my husband and I was like, he's got so many certificates and diplomas and stuff. <laughs> well, this is just kind of the, uh, Jeff, Jeff has much more than I do, I imagine. This is the stuff I could fit on the wall. Uh, the, 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 the two there are uh, uh, Georgetown University and uh, my MBA uh, diploma. Uh, that one is an eighth degree black belt. This one's a ninth degree black belt. And a sixth degree black belt. That's fifth degree. I even have a first and second on the wall there somewhere, I think. There's some Chuck Norris stuff up there. I did a lot of work with Chuck Norris over the years. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it's missing. It's, um, there's one you may just be able to see off to the left there, which is uh, June Re Institute, circa 1978. And there's a picture of Jeff Smith holding boards for me to break and a, a little handwritten letter there from, uh, from June Re when I tested for first degree black belt. Um, so, uh, that gives you a little rundown of, of what's back. Also a little flyer, if you can see on uh, right underneath, right there. That's a flyer from the first school, which is laughing at all the school at this point, but in 1974. Uh, so it's a June Re Institute, Tulsa, Oklahoma flyer, with also a picture of Jeff Smith there. Uh, I think it was a picture from when you knocked out Jim Butin um, in your uh, early title defense. If that, uh, if that one makes sense. So, so there you go, a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, also a, 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 run, a Roadrunner Coyote uh, uh, print, which is a, a, a quote I like. It says, a fanatic is somebody who redoubles his effort when he has forgotten his aim. Uh, so I, uh, yeah. I actually bought that one on a whim at Mall of America years ago when we were at the Diamond Nationals. So there you go, a bunch of stuff on the wall. Anyway. So uh, uh, I guess all that would be to say Master Smith and I uh, um, together have been in martial arts for uh, like 90 years or something like that. Uh, uh, certainly between okay. us. Uh, I started in 1969, you started in what, 1963. Uh, more important for our purpose here. And Bob, for some reason, I'm having trouble muting some of this stuff. You might try uh, muting some of the background. I don't know what I'm, uh, what I'm doing wrong here. If uh, I, I don't think I have control, sir, but I'll check. I'll see if I can do something. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so uh, more important for our purposes here is that we've been running martial arts schools professionally, <clears throat> really making our exclusive professional income uh, from our, uh, running martial arts schools, at least since the 70s. You knew what, Master Smith, early 1970s, um, and um, uh, me – I would say professionally since 1979. Uh, the amount of money we've run through martial arts schools, and Don, you've been working with me for almost that long. Uh, Don, what would you say? My Like Karate has uh, uh, certainly generated well over $100 million over its uh, time here in Denver. Uh, and I would say that you, your indirect influence uh, since that has been probably at least equal, if not double, uh, nationally. You know. Well, probably into the billions, uh, truth be told. Um, and uh, Jeff Smith, just through both Junior Institute and World Champion Jeff Smith Karate and My Life Karate, probably had, uh, what, uh, $250 million or so 
in actual hard dollar revenue through those organizations. So I guess that just to say, I mean, we've got quite a background in running martial arts schools professionally. Um, um, I got quite a bit of press years ago, people knew me for at the time for moving to Denver and opening five schools in 18 months, six schools in uh, 36 months. But when I did that, it was 1,500 active after five months when I was 25 and almost 2,500 active after 36 months when I was, uh, what would I be, about 27 at the time. So, so and we, none of us have, uh, have uh, looked backwards since. But anyway, on, on the, uh, you know, the complete failure school program, if I were going to- Usually it doesn't matter. Hey, Michael, mute yourself. There you go. Thank you, Michael. Um, that, wor that worked. It, you, you yell at somebody and tell them to mute themselves. I guess that, that accomplishes the same objective. Um, but, you know, if I was going to summarize that whole package of information that you've got, is I might summarize it in two or three simple pieces. Number one is we find a lot of the schools that are already making quite a bit of effort on uh, marketing. Uh, like a gentleman I just talked to um, about an hour ago, um, uh, Dan, is he's out running around doing an awful lot of, of live event marketing, doing eight or ten moments a month from live event marketing, but in just a little bit of analysis of what he's doing, he probably should be doing 30 or 40 enrollments a month just from what he's already doing from the time he's already doing it, just changing his strategy a little bit. So once point of summary is sometimes it's not the efforting that that needs to be enhanced it's the it's the um, uh, specific details of how you do it in his case like this month he said he has four live events he's going to have a booth uh, he's doing a pretty good job it seems getting leads when he does the booth but an example of one of our members we should have had invited him on the meeting today uh, Colby up in small town Minnesota he went to a, a marathon for six hours, generated 180 leads. Now we define a lead as name, address, phone number, email address, and so forth. But of those 150 made appointments on the spot, of those uh, about 100 of them actually showed up in the school and took a free lesson, 55 enrolled, and then four weeks later he did 200,000 cash from renewing those people. Now, I compare that with Dan that I just talked to, and Dan would go to a live event and get comparable number of leads but wasn't making appointments on the spot and therefore would have maybe 10 intros out of 100 leads rather than having um, um, you know Colby's type of ratios which should have been if he had 100 leads he gets 50 55 60 intros and at least 30 enrollments so one tweak there uh, changes the dynamic and in, in this case would have gotten him quadruple if not more actual results in terms of enrollments so one takeaway is Sometimes you'll hear stuff, and, and we talk to school owners all the time, and they say, well, I do that, or I used to do that, it didn't work, or I've been doing that. And what they don't realize is there's one or two pieces that could be missing that will quadruple or, or more than multiply that, their results. So that's one takeaway from all of that uh, content is there might be something subtle. There might be um, uh, follow-up and methodology for contact, uh, whether you're text messaging them sequentially, uh, live outbound call, which of course a lot of times people don't answer the phone anymore, using email appropriately rather than expecting it to do much for you, uh, using retargeting on Google and Facebook and so forth. So one takeaway is sometimes you're doing a bunch of stuff that's working okay, but we might be able to plus it, triple it, quadruple it more uh, just with a couple of tweaks, like in, in this case with the, the example of Dan, instead of generating leads and then trying to call them later, generate leads, make appointments on the spot when face-to-face -face with them, follow up with them effectively to get a high show rate, but then also don't give up on them. One of the things in our conversation that he was doing is making a good run at them for about a week and then giving up. What I find is anytime you go to them, you're going to them on their schedule and they may be very interested in what you do. And just because they don't come in in January doesn't mean they don't have an interest in what you do. It may just mean that January is a bad time for them. But if you follow up, you might get them enrolled in March. You might get them enrolled in May. You might get them enrolled in August. 
So a key element is sequential and continuous uh, repetitious follow-up. And by that, I do not mean just put them in an email autoresponder. And, and a takeaway, by the way, is write this down. Email is dying a slow and painful death. Don't expect email to be very productive for you. Uh, what we know in today's world, when I wrote the first book on internet marketing uh, 17 years ago, I loved email, but it was still the era of like, remember that sappy movie, You've Got Mail? And you got Tom Hanks and Meg Whitman are sitting there watching their AOL icon, hoping the mailbox will click so that they have a new email. Nobody does that anymore, right? Teenagers, young adults, many of them don't even use email at all. I mean, if I emailed my daughter, she might read it. Um, you know, it's not a, a mechanism that they're using. Uh, the second element of it is, is that uh, the stat that I saw most recently, and I imagine it's worse now, was that the average person getting 145 emails a day, the average person's getting four pieces or three pieces of direct mail in their mailbox per day. Uh, which is more likely to be read, junk mail or spam? Uh, well, what we know is into their mailbox is much more likely to get read, especially if they already have some interest um, in what you're doing. Uh, the other thing we know is the era of it's just of, of, of um, um, God, sleepless in Seattle, whatever it was, the you've got mail. The era that that was, text messaging is pretty close to that same level of enthusiasm and responsiveness now. So... What we know is if you're not effectively using, and whoever's calling in from 334, yep, they got, they got themselves before I got a chance to yell at them. Uh, so uh, um, what we know is text messaging has nearly 100% deliverability, nearly 100% open rate. So it is fresh and useful, similar to what email was 12, 15 years ago, right? So that's one takeaway. And often, a lot of times you're, doing stuff that's productive and useful, but if you tweaked it, you might be able to get four times, five times, 10 times the results in terms of new people enrolling. Um, a direct marketing concept, by the way, is you don't care about exposure. If, you know, if you're on Facebook, you don't particularly care about likes. I mean, it's useful as a byproduct, but just having your name out there is not particularly uh, productive for for um, an organization like a martial arts school, what you want is enrollments. And the way that you get enrollments is you get their contact information so you can follow up proactively and you get them in right away uh, to make a commitment. Uh, so, Pastor Smith, we lost your video. I'm I don't know. Anyway, so that's one takeaway. Uh, another takeaway I would say is that um, uh, don't get fixated on one or two things being your, your primary or your exclusive way of, of driving your school. Is the terminology I stole this years ago from Jay Abraham is the Parthenon. So think of the Greek Parthenon and what is it? It's a whole bunch of different pillars that are holding up the roof. And Generally, what I find is, you know, MMA guys right now, probably because of me through uh, uh, the influence with, with uh, some of the top MMA schools in the country, got very fixated on internet marketing. And by the way, is done properly, uh, pay-per-click, SEO, uh, now Facebook advertising uh, with email, is you can, it, it, in, in that arena, you can do a, a pretty good volume from that. It's always a mistake to get fixated on one thing. Uh, again, Don, you were running schools when Karate Kid 1 and 2 and 3 came, came out. When Karate Kid came out, we could all get tons of traffic from the Yellow Pages. Now, that didn't mean the Yellow Pages was a great source. It meant that Karate Kid was generating a lot of interest, and then they went and looked for a Yellow Pages for a, a martial arts school. When uh, Billy Blanks was on the infomercial constantly with Tybo, same thing was happening. People are going to the Yellow Pages to look and call martial arts schools and ask if they did kickboxing. What they meant, of course, was Taibo or cardio kickboxing. Um, Google is no different than the modern version, the digital version of the Yellow Pages. So don't get, if you're getting great traffic from it, great. Keep it up. 
maximize it, maximize it, but don't get fixated on it. Don't have that be your primary source. More traditional schools tend to get fixated on what they call word of mouth, or they get fixated on one or two um, activities to drive traffic. Again, I mentioned uh, Dan earlier. Dan, if you're on the meeting, uh, let us know. Um, but uh, don't get fixated on one thing. Make sure you build the Parthenon. So what we're always, uh, another takeaway from that program, and you'll hear it all through, is you hear Master Smith talking about, I don't know what it is, 52 different little grassroots marketing ideas, every one of which works. Many of them may not give you a 50 uh, student flood of new students in a week, but every one of them is going to give you traffic. So everything from rack cars to flyers on the Domino's box as it goes out, uh, usually tied with a charitable fundraiser, uh, bandit signs, banners on the on the front door. You can go on and on on that list. I forget what there was, 52 or 53 things on the list. Every one of those things work. The more of them you do, the more each one of them work because they get um, synergy going with one another. Uh, but again, from one, a marketing perspective, one is looking at each thing you do for tweaks for you know, ne never letting yourself get fixated on this person is saying, let's pick a, a subject, birthday parties. This person is saying birthday parties work great. I've done birthday parties, I got nothing out of it, therefore birthday parties don't work. Well, if, if there's evidence that people are making something like birthday parties work, you did it and it didn't work, it's you. And it's not you personality, business, body odor, it's you what are the details and how they're going about it? And again, you know, I mean, I, I'm not very charitable about this, but I talk about the bozo explosion of consultants going on around our industry. But I, you know, I, I was watching somebody's video recently, uh, um, uh, Brandon Belizo, and he's talking about they have this machine of birthday parties. But then what he says is he says the dumbest thing I've ever heard clear uh, lack of understanding of basic marketing principles. He says, what we do is we give them a, a goodie bag, we put one of our rack cards in it, so therefore, if they're interested in martial arts, we know they'll call us. I don't know if you guys, who, who has kids, uh, I have a nine-year-old, I have a 16-year-old, uh, between going to all the girls' party when my daughter was younger and all the boys' parties now, I gotta tell you, the goodie bags never get past the back seat of the car they end up in the trash can on the way into the house. If something's stuck in the goodie bag for us to look at later, I would never see it. That's problem number one. Problem number two is what he said explicitly was that they didn't get name, address, phone number, email address, nor proactively follow up. Big mistake. You've got to proactively follow up or people are busy. They'll forget you exist. The the other mistake that was made in that statement, and it's a big one, is on the way into any live event that's held at your school, you want to make sure you not only have name, address, phone number, email address, but you make an appointment for their next visit right then and there with a good reason for them to come back. Now, if you don't do that, what we know is this. The good thing about today's market and the ev of evolution of technology is there are a lot of ways to communicate with other people. There's Snapchat and there's Instagram and there's Pinterest and there's Facebook and there's email and there's text messaging and there's uh, uh, retargeting on all, all those online platforms and there's email and there's direct mail. I can go on, I keep going on the list. The thing we know is most people aren't paying attention to any of it very much, right? They're scattered all over the place. So the ability to have impact on follow-up is, is difficult now. You've got very uh, scattered attention, even in the best. So if, you're, if your primary way of follow-up is pick up the phone and call them, what we know in the mobile world is what happens. If I get a call on my, on my uh, uh, phone from an unknown number, do you answer it? I don't. I'm worse than most, I know. I, if I get a call and I don't have, know who it is and have an appointment in my schedule, short of it being one of my kids, I don't answer the phone, right? 
Don will tell you. I mean, I, 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 I work by appointment exclusively. If I have an appointment in my calendar and it's the person I have an appointment with, I answer the phone. Otherwise, I don't. Now, most people aren't me, but most people, if they don't know the number, what do they do? Let it go to voicemail. Now, my 16-year-old daughter has adopted my habit. You know what my voicemail says? It says, I don't use voicemail. Why are you leaving me a voicemail? Right? So what happens is in the era of get a whole bunch of leads, sit down and do outbound phone calls, that era, the outbound call, by the way, is very, very effective when they answer the phone. But we know that you can't just plan on calling 100 people and getting hold of 90 like we used to be able to do, right? Now, there are ways around that. One of the things that we do is when we have a, a live event, we share with them, what is it called? A, um, a Don, you'll know, V-card, is that what it's called? Where you share the contact information. V-card. V-card, right. I got it right. So we have automated systems where we share a V-card. A lot of you guys probably already got that. Uh, we, we had one go out to you probably. Uh, but we're at a, a live event. We'll share the V-card. Now we're in their, uh, their database. So when we call, what we know is if they ignore us, they're choosing to ignore us, not just failing to answer the phone because it's a, a number they don't recognize. Does that make sense? So we know in today's world, one is you want to get the appointment when you're face-to-face -face with them. That's the time that's most likely. Number two is you want to have effective follow-up mechanisms to confirm the appointment. But next, we want to be communicating with them, um, live outbound call, text message, direct mail, uh, retargeting Google, retargeting Facebook, email, all of it, not just sending them a couple of emails hoping that they'll read it, or putting somebody on the phone and calling them once from a number they don't recognize, and then assuming because they didn't answer the phone, they weren't interested. See, I mean, that's just the wrong assumption. Is that making sense for everybody? Questions about this? We've been we've been going about 25 minutes or so. Um, uh, questions about this or anything else that you guys have come across so far? Matt, you had a question? No, he's just messing around with his iPad. I'm uh, putting my, my, my charger in. Oh, okay, okay. okay uh, Master Oliver, I would say that if they have questions, all this technology, you already have this in, you know, for their, uh, that they can access and which are the best providers and. Yeah. Well, and the good thing about it is now it's all cheap, right? Yeah. Um, I was just talking with, uh, with Jason from Kicksites, who's one of the software uh, providers. I, I, I had never looked at their system before, so I don't have a, a specific feedback on it. Uh, but what I, what I will say is, we tend towards simple little apps that are inexpensive and effective that do a, a piece of it. Uh, certainly everybody should have their billing automated. You should also have follow-up text message, voicemail, and email automated. Um, and generally, and they're all friends of mine, I hate to uh, be disparaging anyway, but generally somebody who does a, a software package for martial arts schools that tries to be all things to all people usually is not very good at any of them. So uh, that's, that's generally my, uh, my takeaway on that. Um, but anyway. Um, Can I add something, Master Oliver? Of course. I, I think what everybody uh, out there that is having trouble, you know, most of the schools think they just need more people in the school. And it's, it's true, they do need more people. And the reason they need more people is that they're losing them so fast you really have to have an effective uh, system of monitoring the retention because uh, if you have 15 go out and you have 15 come in, then you basically stay the same. So if you're monitoring on a, a monthly basis what your active count is, because that's going to tell you whether you're green and growing or rot and, 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 right. and rotting. So uh, you got to make sure that you're filling your school up and there's two things that make it happen much quicker. One is the marketing and two is the retention. So we have systems and you'll see uh, in the stuff we sent you, it'll have information about those things. So pay particular attention to it. Now the marketing things that I find, um, you know, a lot of school owners have been around 20 years or longer or 15 years or 10 years, you know, so it's like a lot of them have tried 
every marketing thing out there and it didn't work. And it didn't work not because it, it the system didn't work, it was the way you worked it. So it's not how you do it. I mean, uh, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. So you got to make sure that when you're doing monitor your progress, if you're not getting people because all of these marketing things that we're doing, we have people now on a monthly basis and we have a 70 schools that are giving us feedback on the things that are working. So we're right on the cutting edge of what's working now, not what worked 10 years ago and how to work it properly. So you get the most effective. And the thing that master Oliver has been able to do is to train them how to get the leads and how to convert the lead into an appointment. And if you go to the live event, and even if you get their contact information, like you were saying about somebody you talked to earlier today, you don't get near as many people. You got to go back and chase them forever. And if you have 100 or 200 leads and you're chasing that many, you're spending all your time doing that. Uh, you know, we have automated systems that are going to text them, that are going to send them a voicemail. Uh, the, the voicemail is, is real simple. Uh, it's just going to talk to them about their free offer and let them know that you're trying to get a hold of them. But like you said, emails don't always work. People get so many junk emails, they just think it's a, it's a, uh, you know, a regular ad. But the, the text message, I think, is one of the best... Uh, so it's important that when you get a number, you get a cell number, not just a home number, because most people aren't answering their home phone these days. But they are good for leaving, you know, automated uh, calls and things like that. Yeah. Well, I, and I'll tell you something else. If you got a big lead, lead database and you don't know if it's a landline or a mobile, um, our experience has been in, in testing those numbers is that about 70, 75 percent of the numbers that people are giving you. Uh, when you're out in an event or, or some other uh, mechanism are mobiles. Uh, so, or at least they're text capable. So uh, a lot of even what people are using now is landlines also accept te text messages. So, so you can, if, if, you, if you already have uh, numbers, assume it is a mobile unless proven otherwise, because you'll be 75% uh, likely for it to be true. Uh, but anyway, so, so, so moving on is... I have a question real quick. Go ahead, um, I am a new general manager and my husband's the owner of the school and we took it over from our Renchi and um, I'm having to learn how to run a business from the get-go and uh, so like pricing packages and offers and stuff like that I have a plan set out for marketing and trying to get new traffic and we have a lot going on right now and we're having to move from our current unit to another unit and having to do construction there to get ready because we're rebranding at the same time and I'm trying to come up with all this stuff and I'm just wondering if in the CDs and the books and the templates, does it, you know, does it help guide me in that direction of um, being a successful school? How many active students do you have now from the school you're taking over? Um, well, when we took over in July last year, we had, I would say, 55, because he did not do a lot of marketing. Um, then when we took over, all the instructors quit. So myself and my husband, uh, we were the instructors, so not only was I instructing, but I had to learn how to do all this other stuff. And little by little, they are trickling away okay. because... Um, let's, just, let's just start with that, right? Okay. So you're moving the facility, um, so let's just consider this a startup, okay? Okay. Um, uh, the, the rule of a startup is spend all the money on marketing as little as possible on anything else okay so okay but what the mistake that everybody makes is they go build the taj mahal and again i use a lot of movie references but you know the the build it and they shall appear only happens in kevin costner movies right is it doesn't matter how pretty the new facility is if you don't have it full and the prettiest uh, 
of school I've ever seen was full to the brim with students, right, at all hours of the night, so uh, day and night. So rule number one, and this is a simple one, and it's going to sound stupid and oversimplified, but rule number one is there are no problems uh, that can't be solved by adding 100 new students. Right. So now the question is, is, is there the material in there for that? Sure. Is what almost everybody will do is be lazy, cheap, and ineffective in the marketing, and then they'll be sloppy in converting them to new students. And that material that we sent you is, uh, it was really recorded in three different sessions. They were marketing boot camps that typically we charge uh, five to $7,000 to attend. Uh, Master Smith's version was from a different one than the rest of the material. But if you went and did every grassroots um, um, thing that he talks about in that section, and then you did all the stuff that I talk about on the first day of, of, the, um, of the program to go get new people, you generate plenty of traffic. And then the other uh, section was all about how to close with a high percentage when you're drinking from a fire hose, meaning you have more introductory traffic than you know how to deal with, right? Now, none of it is going to teach you how to create a PL, how to deal with the IRS, how to do payroll, how to hire people, train. None of it, that's not the content there, right? But the content is how to go get 100 students. And when you get a flood of new people, how to enroll. And that's number one most important thing. Again, if I went back to me opening six schools, well, what was the number one function that I needed? Nothing else mattered. Every school, when I opened the doors, I wanted 100 students in the first month. I wanted 100 in the first month. I wanted 290 days. If you get 100 in the first month, uh, 200 in the first 90 days, you have positive cash flow. You have momentum. You have enough people that you can put in place referral systems, family add-on systems. So you can be getting mom and dad. You can be getting sisters, brothers, friends. You can be having birthday parties, buddy events, whatever, whatever it is. You've got enough critical mass and momentum for that type of stuff to kick in because at 55 students or less than that, you don't have the ability to grow through internal growth. There's just not enough there. Plus there's a little bit of, you know, people are probably a little still uneasy with everything uh, in addition to that. So your number one focus, and I don't care, it's not dealing with building inspectors, it's not dealing with contractors, it's not, you know, dealing with payroll tax people, it's not dealing with IRS, it's not dealing with payroll services, it's not, screwing around with software, it's go get 100 new students. And, you know, if you look at, if you knew nothing else to do, if you took a right out the door of the school every morning and started going residential and knocking on doors, talking to people who answered the phone, uh, giving them information and making an appointment for those that would be interested, you know, you might only get somebody to answer the door one out of 10 times, and you only might get a positive response one out of 10 times and you might get an appointment for, um, uh, for half of them. But if you did that consistently uh, every day, you would get enough new enrollments. Now, I don't recommend that as the strategy. There's a lot of other things that we can teach you that are higher leverage, where you're gonna talk to more people in bigger groups and more effectively. However, the reason why 90% of martial arts schools go out of business and the reason why half of all small businesses, but probably 75% of martial arts schools are what can be charitably referred to as walking dead, meaning that they're open every month, the owner could be making more money on an annual basis, per hour basis, weekly basis, working for somebody else than running their business, is they're not willing to just jump off the cliff and do what it takes to get enough people in the door. Ironically, in martial arts, and I've had this conversation with, you know, uh, Dan Kennedy and Tony Robbins and uh, um, um, Jay Abraham and a lot of very, you know, famous marketing people and uh, business people, uh, consultants. And they all say the same thing as I do is, you know, the, the sadness about martial artists is the whole thing that they've learned over the years is self-discipline. So they have the self-discipline to get up every day and work on their 
art and to encourage their students to be diligent mm -hmm. in their training, but then they don't take that self-discipline they already know and apply it to go get 100 students, right? Um, and then what they'll do is they'll sit at their desk and lament how slow it is and lament how the economy is bad or lament how it's a bad location or lament why nobody's interested in Tai Kung Fu or whatever it might be. All of that is horseshit. It's all an excuse for just not going and running the business and getting out and, and doing what they need to do. Uh, the other thing that's funny, by the way, is if you watch online, there's all these crazy nutcases that are doing uh, uh, one that has a big rant about me, uh, uh, Stephen Oliver's Million Dollar McDojo. There's all these guys that are ranting about McDojos and uh, uh, belt factories and all this crap. There's not a one of them that's not broke. There's not a one of those guys that's spending their time stressing about that stuff that's not broke. The reason that they've got this fixation is their excuse for themselves is they say, I'm a high integrity teacher, martial artist. Those guys are McDojos because how can they not be a McDojo since Oliver has 3,000 students? I only have 30. I must be pure. No, the guy that only has 30 is lazy or stupid or both, right? That's the difference. But all of that McDojo crap and Bell Factory crap is just a good excuse for being lazy or being ignorant in the processes to run a school. Does that make sense? So, Mr. Yes. Oliver, let me interject. You know, it's it's hard to be objective when you're saying you produce good students because every instructor thinks they're producing good students. You know, one way to tell is competition and there's national and and, and you know, world and and state competitions and our schools have done uh, as much as the best school in the country in producing some of the best uh, world champions in point, forms, weapons, uh, kickboxing, all of them. So, uh, you know, we have a track record of- Including you, by the way. And we have the quality of the students. So it's not, you have to sacrifice the quality to have the business. Don't ever think that. Because well, you have to make sure that you're doing the business. Well, and let's, let, let's take that a step further, Master Smith. Almost all martial arts schools produce everybody that they touched is horrible at martial arts. Okay, now, now understand what I'm, what I'm saying. If you have your jacket on from your school and you're standing in line at Starbucks and some adult or parent or child says, oh, you do karate. Well, how's the conversation go? I know how, it all, how they all go. They say, oh, I used to do that. Oh, great. I'll always say, how far did you get? They'll usually say gold belt or green belt, something like that. What I know is they never got particularly good to begin with, and they know nothing now other than they had either an entertaining or a painful experience some number of years ago. So the guys who, who uh, profess themselves to be most um, stringent, to be most strict, including some that have produced a couple of high quality competitors. If you look at the number of people they've touched over the years and ask yourself how many of them dropped out in the first six months, therefore are permanently horrible at martial arts versus how many of them got to black belt or at least trained for three or four years is 99% of everybody they ever touched dropped out in six to eight months or earlier. Therefore, 99% of everybody they touched, no matter what their lineage, no matter how great their instructor is, no matter how famous their style is, no matter how accomplished they are as an athlete, no matter the fact that they produced one or two champions, 99% of everybody they touched is horrible at martial arts because they dropped out at Goldbound, they're now the person that's talking to me in the line at Starbucks, telling me, oh, I used to do that a long time ago. I got to my Goldbound. Never forget that. The thing that Master Smith said earlier is the only way you get somebody to be good at martial arts is you keep them four years, six years, 10 years, and you don't keep them for four years, six years, 10 years if you don't get them past the first year. 
and you don't get them past the first year if you don't get them past the first 90 days. So your number one priority always is high quality student service and getting them from year one to year two. Doesn't matter how, how physically talented your white belts are if they drop out at gold belt. What matters is they get to year two, they get to year three, they get to year four. Several people on the meeting here have been to our black belt testing. They can tell you it's the meanest, roughest, toughest, nastiest. They show up on Friday. They don't sleep until Sunday. It's the hardest black belt test I've yet to see for, you know, even kids who are eight years old. However, we don't do that to the white belts. What we want is everyone we touch as close as humanly possible that we get them to graduate to black belt, second degree black belt, third degree black belt. Therefore, we know they've had life-changing emotional, intellectual, physical, mental benefits from training in martial arts. So they're not like all of those other guys who are saying they're rough and tough and 99% of everybody they touch permanently and forever sucks at martial arts because they dropped out in six months. And if you ever start questioning uh, the, the, um, how high quality you are versus somebody else, it's only one question to ask. What's your graduation rate to black belt? What's your monthly graduation rate? What percentage of the students that you enroll make it to year two? What percentage of them make it to year three? If they're getting to year three, year four, year five, you're producing quality students. If they're dropping out in six months, doesn't matter how athletic you are, how many titles you won, how many damn diplomas are on the wall. All that stuff is irrelevant, right? Um, all of that stuff is irrelevant. What matters is you get them to year two, year three, year four, and at that point, they can master a quality curriculum if you are, in fact, teaching it. Does that help, Heather? But yeah, it does. It does because, um, you know, that's what I'm running into right now is the fact that when I'm a, a veteran, and so therefore I'm structured. And when I was going through my journey to my first degree black belt, um, I saw a lot of things that need to be fixed. Sure. And so now that we took over, I'm trying to fix those things. And um, I believe in teaching mind, body, spirit, you know, education, along with the art of martial arts. I believe in that solely. And I'm trying to build, you know, curriculum around that and structure. And right now it, with this, group of parents and these students that are from my instructor um they like you know, the old way they want everything given to them and i don't believe in that i believe that you have to earn your rank as you go from white I belt you, and up. Can I give you a suggestion heather yes what you, what you need to do is exactly what master oliver said you need to get 100 students those uh, 40 or 50 that you have, you need to get rid of most of those because yes. a rotten apple will spoil the barrel. So don't try to solve all those problems. Just tell them they're not happy with what you're doing and they need to find a school that they're going to be happy in. You'll be glad to, uh, you know, help them uh, leave. I'm got to have new people coming in. I might say a little bit more diplomatically, Master Smith, which is I know really? wildly, wildly out of character. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I understand what both of you are saying. And we, my husband and I, we both understand that. That's our goal. And um, we're actually about to travel to go for instructor training in Krav. And because uh, I get a lot of phone calls um, that, sitting at my that, desk. Is that, what huh? you, is that what you teach now? Um, right now, we're teaching um, the old curriculum until I come up with this new curriculum that I'm writing from. Um, yeah. What style? It's um, Bushido Khan. Okay. So it's no, more why, intensive. Why, 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 okay, hold, hold on, hold on, Heather. Why, right. why, well, don't mess with going out and doing Krav training. It's completely irrelevant to what you're doing. You're a black belt in something. Your husband's a black belt in something, right? Yes. Right. You've got. Well, it's in martial arts. I mean, uh, Premier Martial Arts International. Okay. And then, uh, then uh, you need to focus on. 
<laughs> don't go learn a different curriculum. Don't put any any effort into go learning Krav. It's a waste of your time. Not that there's anything wrong with Krav, but you know a curriculum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't start at the top and work your way down trying to fix what's there. What you want to do is add 100 new white belts and fix everything from the bottom up, not from the top down. Okay? All right. get, 100, All right. get 100 new white belts, do character development curriculum, do focus on discipline. Uh, are you predominantly teaching kids or adults? Um, both. What's your focus? Mine is kids. Okay, so go get 100 new kids and families, focus on discipline and focus and self-esteem, do job lists and do all the character development stuff, have them read quality books. I'd recommend Psychology of Winning as a simple one, what to say when you talk to yourself as a simple one. Go fix the white belt program. What, don't let those 100 new students get infected with the cancer that any of the other 55 have. Put 100 new students into your school, fix your white belt curriculum, fix your first year curriculum, and then what will happen, and this is where I was being a little bit more um, uh, diplomatic than you were, Master Smith, is some of those 55, as soon as they see the school thriving from below them, will get with the program. What doesn't happen is if they see a failing school and they see stress and trauma and they see conflict, they aren't going to get with the program until they see you're being successful. What always happens with martial artists is we think that our black belts, our brown belts, our advanced students are the most loyal, and that's backwards. Our black belts and our brown belts are most loyal to what we used to do. And if we used to run a very high quality, very profitable, very successful school, great. If we're trying to change anything, they're the ones that get, on, get with the program last because they're mm -hmm. looking to the past, not to the future. Does that make sense? So yeah. fix it from the bottom up. Go get 100 okay. belts. Focus on your first year curriculum. Focus on your white belt curriculum. Focus on physically teaching what you know, because there's no mass, you know, there's no mystery. If if I'm a Taekwondo stylist, I don't need to go learn Kempo. If I'm a Kempo stylist, I don't need to go learn Krav. If I'm a Krav stylist, I don't need to go learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. If I'm a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guy, I don't need to go learn Muay Thai. What you're teaching is fine. Teach them that physical curriculum, overlay mental, emotional, personal development onto that curriculum, find a target audience that you're most comfortable with, right? But 100 new students to the school should add a 20,000 or more gross revenue to the school. All of the other problems get solved. If you have 100 new white belts, you add $20,000 to the school, and then the other students will either get with the program or they go away. And if they continue to be cancerous, fire them. If you need the script for how to fire them, I'd be happy to give you the script. Ms. Ms. Jones, I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm dead serious. Ms. Ms. I dead. would appreciate that. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Jones, I'm, I'm, I'm so disappointed that we have failed you, that you haven't been happy with the transition here at the school. I believe we have an exciting future, but I know uh, you have some ideas of what you'd like. I've gone to liberty of putting together the 10 schools that are closest to us. I start the ones that I personally believe would be the best fit for you. So this one, this one, this one, I would recommend you go look, look, uh, look at. I've taken the liberty of canceling the balance of any payments that you might have. And I'd be happy to give you a recommendation to any and every one of those schools, that, at least any that I know. Sounds easy enough. So my next question to that is um, pricing, because I don't know how to price. Um, that's just another thing that's like weighing heavy on my mind. And as we go into this is how do I price things? Well, uh, we have a rule on all of our non-member conversations that <laughs> I keep holding Master Smith accountable for and he keeps holding me accountable for, which <laughs> Not to discuss price for okay. one. Very, no, no, no. I, I'm going to discuss price. I'm going to break the rule. <laughs> but I, I'm telling. I'm. I'm telling you what. When I talk to school owners, and this is true of 
I talked to one recently who was in Malibu, California, another one that was in Manhattan. Um, when I talk to school owners anywhere in North America, and this also includes in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, the one thing that they can't get their mind around is pricing. And I've had people in, in uh, um, a good friend of mine, Ernie Reyes uh, Sr., uh, and his partner, Tony Thompson, a few years ago now, I was out at their school doing a meeting for all of the staff. you might uh, uh, mute yourself there. Uh, welcome, but mute yourself. Uh, but I was doing uh, coaching for their organization, and they're in Silicon Valley. Now, if you don't know where Silicon Valley is, Silicon Valley roughly is the, the stretch that is between Stanford University and San Jose. And more recently, it's kind of become San Jose to San Francisco, right? That's where they're located. And they said to me, the dumbest thing I perhaps ever heard a human being say about pricing, but they said to me, the cost of living is so high in Silicon Valley, we can't charge any more than we're charging. And it was in the context of I said, why is it you guys are in Silicon Valley and you're charging half of what I'm charging in Denver, Colorado? So they said, oh, Cost of living is so high in, in Silicon Valley, they can't possibly. <laughs> well, the reason that the cost of living is expensive anywhere is because salaries are high. On average, if I work in Manhattan, I make more money than if I work in Dodge City, Kansas. Uh, if I'm in Silicon Valley, on average, I make more money than if I, um, uh, you know, I'm in Denver, Colorado. It just, you know, that's just the, you know, the basics. Um, and so uh, on pricing, what I will say is the first thing not to do, notice I said not, first thing not to do is to call the 20 schools in your area and let that be feedback about anything because it's irrelevant to what you're doing, okay? Right, so I agree. Don't, don't spend any time worrying about what everybody else is charging. Uh, the second thing to realize is that simple math, are you better off with, 300 students at 200 a month, or are you better off with, um, uh, I'm sorry, if you had 100 students at 300 a month or 300 students at 100 a month, which would you be better off? Uh, 300 students with 100? No, you'd be better yeah. off with 100 at 300. You'd make a lot more money, you need less space, you need less staff, and they'd be less bitchy, they'd stay longer, and they'd be better students, okay? Right. So if you think that raising the price when they come in the door is going to have fewer people enroll, number one, that's wrong thinking. But number two, all that matters in running the school is quality students, keep them a long time, have a positive impact in the community, and there's money left at the end of the day, right? Right. So, so what, you, what you're always looking at on pricing is, you know, and I, I talk to a lot of school owners who are so low, they're trying to make it up on volume. We're not in a business where you do that. If, well, if uh, well, one school can charge 50 a month, another could charge 150 a month, another could charge 300 a month, and that's not going to have any impact into how many intros they generate. And it's honestly not going to have much of an impact on their conversion rate, except statistically we've seen at the higher price point, the conversion rate will tend to be higher. In other words, 10 intros, I enroll six versus 10 intros, I enroll four they'll do better. Does that make sense? So it, it does. It's just, uh, you know, like for the past four years, I've been hearing my other instructor tell me, um, because we live in a poor area, I just heard a lot of excuses and not a lot of solutions. And so that was one of my um, main reasons as to why I got your program and wanted to speak with all of you who have been where I've been and have made the headway. And, so that's why I and Master Oliver, if, if, uh, if we could get uh, Heather to uh, give Bob Dunn a call and set up an appointment to chat a little bit, because probably everybody out there doesn't need all of the stuff she's asking for, but we can help her more one-on-one -on -one if we need. And uh, again, Bob, what is your number? It's, uh, I'll tell you, it's 720-256-0208. 720-256-0208. I didn't mess that one up this time, did I, Bob? No, sir. 
Okay. Uh, but if y'all okay. will do that, because uh, everybody has unique things that they're going to need. What we want to try to cover is the masses today as much as possible. Uh, a, a quick uh, reference for everybody when they're confused on price point. One of our top schools uh, is in Mankato, Minnesota. That's a population of about 35,000 with a median income of 31,000. And uh, he happened to, he's the one who did the marathon thing, but uh, he's the one out of all of our schools. And we have New York, Manhattan, you know, LA, uh, Silicon Valley, everywhere. And uh, in that little Mankato population, 31,000, uh, he ended up with 200,000 a year ago, December. Now he's what? averaging. He's Never. averaging about eighty to ninety thousand a month. So don't think because you're in a small area that you cannot produce uh, a good income. It, it will happen. You just got to know how to do it properly. Wow, yeah. this is this is Heather's husband. What's that number again? Seven two zero two five. It's seven two zero two five six zero two zero eight. Yeah. And, and zero eight. Thank and, you. And, uh, You're and, uh, and uh, to give you a couple of benchmarks, by the way, is take what he just said about Colby. We're what we're targeting the schools that we're working with to be at two percent or below monthly dropout. Three hundred active students. That means they need five or six new students a month to stay even. Okay, that's a that's an important number to know. The other thing we're targeting. He just mentioned Colby. Colby has about 300 active students. I believe the number was 289. We talked to him Tuesday. Well, yesterday, whatever. Uh, of that 289 students, Master Smith just told you what his monthly gross is, 80 to 90,000. That gives you the ratio that we're targeting for the average revenue per student. We want it to be in the 250 to $300 a month range for the average student. Well, uh, so 100 students is 30-ish thousand a month, 200 students is 60-ish thousand a month, 300 students is 90-ish thousand per month. So benchmark number one is 2% or less dropout rate. Uh, benchmark number two is that 250 to 300 average revenue per student per month, right? The, the, you know, there's really two important numbers, how many new students you're getting and what the lifetime value is of each student. The way you fix lifetime value is program structure. Have the trial enrollment, have the renewal pricing with that, but also is retention. Keep them long term. There's there's been trends in the industry where people are are preaching cash everything out, but the reason they cash everything out is they have crappy uh, retention or they have, have high dropout rates. So. <coughs> Pardon me. If somebody is, uh, um, you know, if every student drops out within four or five months and they can get them to pay in full for two years, they're going to get more money from them. Um, I, I have nothing against taking cash, but what I do want to do is I want to make sure all those students are there long term that we're not using that as a leverage point just to get more cash from for services not provided. Does that make sense? If I yeah. could throw in the one, the one, uh, Thing that you've got to make sure that you're a black belt school and we know that if they stayed a black belt that they're going to be there for three or four or five years minimum and uh, our, our school we even have gone beyond black belt because we realize that black belt is the start of their training so second degree is the minimum that we want everybody to be on but you've got to build to that maybe but uh, you know you're either a black belt school or you're just teaching people on a month to month or annual basis yeah and, and it's, it seems it seems like every time we um, have black belts and we go through the boot camp and they graduate and stuff, they quit. They don't come back for expert training. We have expert training, but we don't have anybody that stays for that. That's a longer conversation. Yeah. But, uh, uh, rule number one is before they get the first degree, you renew them the second degree. Before they get the second degree, you renew them the third degree. Rule number two is you treat them at black belt just like you treated them at green belt, which is there's still a test every two months or every three months. 
they're still progress checking, they're still getting rank stripe, tape, whatever. We actually do the, the black bow, the white stripe, black bow, the gold stripe, black bow, the green stripe, black bow, the purple stripe. So they're progress checking every two months. They're moving to a new intermediate belt every four months. They're moving to, you know, a new rank. But uh, actually that elongated the time to second degree and the third degree black belt. We just make sure they're still testing every two and, and four months. Uh, same as underbelt. What happens so many times is it's like high school graduation. You got your black belt, congratulations. Uh, and they're paying month to month. They're not renewed with goals, second, third degree black belt. And um, there's no, you know, the next test is in three years. Well, it's no wonder they, they drop out under those conditions. Heather, what I will say is spend no amount of energy right now on second year, third year, fourth year students, black belts. Fix your first year fix your white belt program, add 100 new white belts, then you can let it bubble up from the bottom rather than try to fix it from the top, okay? Uh, to, to, to go back to what you said a minute ago, one of my favorite quotes, and this is from Tom Hopkins, uh, who's a well-known sales trainer. Uh, I recommend any of his books. But his quote is, never take advice from someone who's more screwed up than you are. Okay? Thank you. I will, I will expand it to never take advice from somebody who hasn't done what you want to do. And I would expand that even further. I would never take advice from somebody who hasn't done what you want to do and proven that they can get other people to replicate their success. Um, and so the opinion mm -hmm. of mother-in-law, instructor, friends, the martial artists that you meet at tournaments are all irrelevant. Uh, you know, if they just drove up in a Mercedes and they're wearing a Rolex, that gives them a little bit more credibility. But then I have to ask, did they do it running a martial arts school or from some other purpose? And then I have to ask, is it just because their personality or have they been able to replicate that? Um, that's why, again, Master Smith and I have always been in the multi-school business. And in a multi-school, it's not about how good I am as a teacher or how good he is as a teacher. It's about our ability to replicate teachers. It's our ability to replicate sales systems, our ability to replicate marketing systems. Does that help? But on pricing- yeah. uh, I will I'm, get there. I will be like one of you. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to it. Our, our membership base, uh, pricing wise, I would say at the low end is about 197 a month for a new enrollment. And at the high end is about 297 a month for a new enrollment. Uh, we're always doing an initial 12 month enrollment presented as a trial enrollment. So we're talking about black belt's going to be four years or whatever, you know, if you're presenting jujitsu or, boy, you know, Krav or whatever. Um, and by the way, Heather, again, this is not a diss on Krav, but an awful, most of the Krav organizations and an awful lot of most of the Muay Thai and, and uh, uh, MMA schools do not have a black belt structure. They don't have regular uh, progress checks, testing structure curriculum. Uh, Master Smith, you were just training with uh, 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 Chief Master Clark in uh, Florida, and they're a notable exception where they've got a complete curriculum and a two-month test cycle, everything else. But most of going and studying something else because, you know, you get some people who call and ask for it, that's a, that's a fool's errand. Don't do that. That's just being a martial artist looking to learn new kicking and punching crap which isn't what is going to fill your school up. You, every, you already know enough uh, martial arts curriculum to teach as many uh, first year students as you can handle. And by the time you get those people in the second year, you can develop and expand from there. That makes okay. sense. And by yeah. the way, the worst idea that per, uh, perpetrates is to say, you know, I'm an Okinawan stylist and I'm also gonna teach cardio kickboxing and I'm also gonna teach Krav Maga and I'm also going to teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Whatever it is that you know that you're good at, just run your school there and fix your ability to market and fill the school up with that. You don't need to keep adding different curriculum because they're not coming to you for the physical movement. They're coming to you for the outcome. Right. Right. I understand. The additional physical movement, again, I don't care what it is, isn't a, 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 a particularly useful. Master Smith and I, you know, we added a bunch of uh, Kali and Eskrima to our curriculum, but it's only as 
a bonus rotating curriculum that we do for our leadership students is not designed to be something new that we're enrolling people into. We do a bunch of prov and grappling, all kinds of stuff. But, you know, basically we just market our primary program, put people in and then use some of this stuff to keep it interesting in the second, third, fourth year, mostly to improve retention. Yeah, and most okay. of our schools, we have a good variety of schools. And so we have BJJ, we have Muay Thai, we have Krav, we have Kempo, we have Taekwondo, we have uh, traditional martial arts, Wushu, uh, Kung Fu, all systems pretty much. And what we find is uh, they might do a few extra things as part of their leadership uh, black belt training, but they all have their core program is their whatever their strength is and build from that is, is where you need to go. Yeah. Okay. That's, I like that. That's good. I like that. Yeah. But now, now let me, and we're going to have to wrap up before long and I'm, uh, we're happy to answer any and all questions. Uh, Jeff, you have a question? I do. Uh, on the testing thing, the, the testing every two months where everyone tests, that's a whole new concept for me. Yeah. Is there something, is there a video on the website that, breaks that down how that works and the progression and are the is there a test fee each time or is that included in the tuition that kind of stuff yes yes that's, that's oh. a big question but and let right. me, yeah. let me yeah. well, that, well, well, the short well, version uh jeff i mean you're a member already so you have access to all of that stuff and um uh, yeah i uh, you ask about test fees i don't particularly like test fees i'd rather not have them um, I'd rather just build it into the tuition. Uh, it, it, as, as a broader case, I don't like nickel and diming students to death. I agree. Right? So every time you go to make a transaction where you're going to ask somebody for money, ask yourself, would you have been better off to just charge them $50 <coughs> and all that stuff was included? <coughs> and in almost all cases, the conclusion is yes. Not always, but in almost all cases, because what, you know, what martial arts schools have a tendency to do is price their tuition too low, but then they're always dinging them. And every time you go ding them, uh, I mean, the worst I ever saw, I'll get myself in trouble again, but I was in a, a Korean Taekwondo school in Fort Lauderdale, and a few of my friends were there watching the school, and it was a kid's class, and all of a sudden, 35 kids come running over to mom with their hand out. And... I, um, I talked to the owner later, we walked in the back and he had this long speech with about how much money he makes from selling boards. It was board breaking day. So it was a buck a board. And he gave me this long speech about how they have a, a, a saw in the back and they cut the boards and it costs them 20 cents per board and they sell them for a buck and they make an extra 3000 bucks a month selling boards. Here's what I saw. I saw three kids in the corner crying because neither mom nor dad was there to give them the buck to break boards. I saw another 10 or, or 12 kids who were a little annoyed because mom gave them a buck or four quarters or something. And uh, the other kids were getting to break more boards. I saw five moms who were at the very least agitated that they were having to dig through their purse. Um, and of course there were some dads there, dig through their wallet or whatever. But I saw three or four parents agitated, visibly agitated that they were having to dig through for a, a, a tr relatively trivial amount of money to, uh, to pay for this thing, right? Worst case example I've ever seen. He was trying to sell me on the fact that he was um, making an extra $3,000 in net profit. And I saw in that class $300,000 in lost revenue from people who may not drop out that day, but are agitated enough with that tactic that they're not gonna be around very long. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you want to be careful about dinging people for, and I don't care whether it's a small or a big amount. I basically want it to be, we do the enrollment, we do the renewal, that's it, as close as humanly possible, all the way through. Uh, Jeff, on all the other stuff, rotating curriculum, the testing, all that, yeah, we have a ton of content on that. Bob can direct you to that, or we can, uh, uh, in your case, we've got to do a complete restructure of things. So that might be something to schedule a time with Master Smith, and he can... Uh, go through that and restructure it for you. Yeah, and we usually start from the other end up, but <clears throat> if you want to know something about the black belt training and how that works, uh, we'll do a call on that. Yeah, that wasn't the question. The question was, is uh, that was Heather's question about black belt dropouts. His question was, he's doing all these privates and everything. We're trying to 
reorganize that and get them well, on. He a, was asking about the black belt curriculum with stripes and stuff. I thought. No. Is that right, Jeff, or wrong? <clears throat> You're on mute. Sorry, I was trying to get unmuted. I was asking more about the uh, testing process, the every two month thing, because we only test when people are ready, basically, instead of like keeping that progression going. And it's yeah, been yeah, a. In other, in other words, Grandmaster Smith, with all great deference, you're wrong, I'm right. Heather was asking about black belts. He's asking about everybody. So, okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, easy, easy fix, Jeff. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. You know, I, I'm in, I'm at uh, 8,000 foot elevation in Evergreen, Colorado, on the top of the mountain right now. He's in uh, Sterling, Virginia. So I give him a much rougher time when we're at distance, and I know that he's got a short enough memory he won't remember it all uh, by the time he gets here next month. <laughs> Isn't that right, Grandmaster Smith? I forgot what you're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Let me let, let me let me finish with this. And again, any questions, ask. Um, but here's the here's the deal is is um, you know I want to congratulate you and apologize at the same time. If you did in fact go through all of the material, whether it's the website or the physical stuff we mailed you in one thing or another, you have a million dollars worth of, of material there that could be implemented and could I mean truly it is is um, uh, the material you need to jumpstart the volume of people coming in the front door and to make sure that when you get that volume more than you've ever had, you can convert them. The apology is our conclusions have been after working with schools for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, is that that kind of distance learning, mail people a bunch of DVDs and turn them over, really is no different than Heather if, um, if you signed up for the online Krav Maga course and they sent you a bunch of DVDs and CDs and expected you to learn this stuff without having a mentor, a teacher, a peer group, people to work with, others going through the process. So the apology is, is my conclusion has been that dumping all that material on you is, is a wasted effort without a mentor, a peer group, ongoing support, and ongoing training. Now that has nothing to do with the quality of the material. The material, if you've gone through it all, in some cases, it probably blows your mind, and in some cases, you may not believe that it's accurate, but it is. Uh, and the, the conversation, by the way, there was zero editing. So we didn't edit anything out, and I probably am a little profane here and there. And if it offends you, I apologize. You know, become less easily offended is the answer. Uh, but what I will say is that our conclusion is the route to success is – the same way that everyone on the on the meeting here, I'm sure, learned martial arts, is to have a peer group of other people going through the process. Again, not taking advice from people who are more screwed up than you are, but to have people who are really successful. Colby doing 80, 90 thousand a month. Um, elite MMA at one school there at 120, 130 a month. People like that. Greg Macy has now the third location. First one's doing 80, 90 a month. The other one's doing 90 to 100 a month. Uh, the, the, the one that's doing 90 a month has been open for 24 months. So having a peer group of other people of that ilk that you're meeting with, learning in real time what they're doing, having somebody who has both been there, done that, and has replicated it for other schools and other locations, looking over your shoulder. I'm sure that your martial arts instructor, if they were any good, Sometimes they were patting you on the back. Sometimes they were kicking your butt. Uh, sometimes they were giving you uh, uh, words of wisdom. Other times they're telling you to get off your ass. But that's what you need. You need accountability. You need mentorship. You need a, a successful peer group. And you need ongoing focus on that. What we also know is that when you mail people a package of information, um, a good chunk never break the shrink wrap. They think that there's some kind of magic pixie dust in spending the money and having it drop on their desk. The very fact of having it sit there is going to have a dramatic transformation. That's, you know, for some reason, uh, that's the way people think. I have a, a friend who's a multimillionaire in M MLM, and that's what he says about that. He says 97% of people who sign up in, uh, in MLM think the, the act of signing up is supposed to make them rich. 
Uh, this is the same way. You've got to go through the CDs, go through the DVDs, take notes, go through the transcripts. Most importantly, you've got to implement. What we know, though, is that 99 times out of 100, the guys who or gals who just get the DVDs and CDs, they are more like the student who walks into your school who says they've been training in martial arts for three years, and in reality, what they've been doing is watching YouTube videos and mimicking them at home. What do you know when you encounter that person? It's going to take you more time to fix all the screw-ups than it is to get it right from the beginning. I know when I'm in Colorado, so I know a lot of people who are ski instructors. They'd rather take somebody like my kids who have never skied before and teach them right. I have some close friends who are golf pros. What do they know? The duffer who's been out there screwing around for 20 years is hard to fix. A new person off the, off the, um, uh, the side who they can start with from scratch is easy, right? So what my apology is, is that we know, and we know that we know, that just dumping a bunch of CDs and DVDs is not the solution, um, even though the content is as good as you will find anywhere. The solution is mentorship, peer interaction, it's accountability, it's holding yourself accountable relative to other people's performance, it's holding yourself accountable uh, relative to your own expectations and it's having somebody looking over your shoulder to sometimes cheer you on and sometimes yell at you is that really is the necessary ingredient. Um, and that is what we do on an ongoing basis. So I am saying all this in a self-serving way, but we came to the conclusion in a, um, um, a, a very focused study of it, within our organization, we used to have uh, almost 1,500 schools that we were mailing them stuff from a distance. And what we found is, with very rare exception, they were not accomplishing anything. We now have a, a, a very small number of schools that are all elite schools that we're working with, and we're holding their hand, we're giving them personal advice. Uh, and Jeff, you've been engaged in some of that uh, already, so you can give them a little bit of feedback one way or the other. Feel free to uh, uh, chip in here. But what we have found is that the long-term success is not about the stuff that dumped on your desk, but it's about that ongoing coaching and clarification and so forth. Jeff, you want to um, uh, make some observations on that? Yeah, I mean, I've only, I've had two meetings and already it's starting to change things. I'm implementing or at least creating the programs that I'm going to be implementing shortly. And um, I got two signups on Monday um, at 2.49 so that's a that's a big step up from where I was. I was at 199 before, and yeah. now I'm at 249, and it was easy. Yeah. yeah. So. And uh, you know, a lot of times, what happens, Master Oliver, uh, the videos for some people, uh, if they take them and they use it as a tool and not as an entertainment, they're not watching it like they're watching a movie, but watch it like they have to study it and take notes and and uh, watch it three or four times each, then you know they'll get some traction. But the problem is that they don't have anybody watching over their shoulder to correct their mistakes. And that's just like doing a home study course of martial arts. You can get some basic stuff down, but uh, when you have an instructor there to correct you, it really facilitates a much quicker learning process and a higher degree of learning and in running a business, of course, it's going to be a higher level of, of uh, gross in the school. Yeah, absolutely. And um, um, the, the, the best distance learning program I ever saw was, uh, you may have heard of the Success Motivation Institute there in Waco, Texas. Uh, they had an offshoot called Leadership Motivation Institute. But what they did was you had a notebook with the transcript, you had an audio CD, and what you did, and this is a, you know, a, a dated reference, but you would listen to the audio CD seven days in a row while reading and taking notes on the written transcript. And then you would have a facilitator discussing uh, the content that you had, did, had, 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 had uh, covered. But all the studies show if you listen to something once in 72 hours, you've forgotten something like 90% of it. So although going through all the CDs will be uh, uh, useful, Mostly what it will be is entertainment. Mostly it's not going to be uh, something that's going to make a dramatic impact in your, your business. If you wanted to truly internalize it, 
do the, and by the way, the DVDs and the CDs are the same content. Somebody asked me that uh, before is do it, uh, you know, do at least each one seven days in a row and read the transcript at least three or four of those days is the, is the first best advice. Unfortunately, I know most people won't do that. They'll go through, get a couple of good ideas and we'll make incremental progress. Uh, the, the, the type of progress we make for people is uh, Colby started with us doing about 27,000 a month. He's now at 85 or 90,000 a month. Jeff, I think you heard him on our last meeting. Um, we've had schools that started with us at 12 who are now doing 50, 60. Uh, Elite MMA started, they, they were, had 200 students charging them $85 a month. They now have one location doing 120 a month. They have uh, three branches, four total. Uh, the three branches are all on the half a million to 600,000 a month range. So our, our top um, uh, 10 or 15 schools that we're working with, if they're multi-schools, they have at least one location doing over a million a year. Single schools, they have a, um, their location is in the million dollar, uh, more or less, uh, range. If a school is doing a million a year, those are not 12,000 square foot schools running 12 programs. We're talking about typically one or two curriculums, and we're talking at least 50% to the bottom line, sometimes more. So we have a number of school owners who are uh, uh, extremely, excuse my language, pissed off at the IRS this month uh, because they've had to write yet again another big check. You heard, uh, Jeff, you heard Paul Pendergast uh, whining about that the other day in December, he did what, $80,000. And I immediately beat him up, so it should have been double that. So um, what you will, you know, the, the reality though is, I would suggest go through that martialartswealth.com forward slash mastermind site, gives you a pretty thorough uh, breakdown of how we're working with schools. Our structure is to work with school owners the same way you work with students, is we get together every week, we're looking over your shoulder personally, uh, we're giving a lot of great resources and content. We're getting all the school owners together to interact uh, as much as daily uh, through online discussion forums and then meeting uh, together periodically, usually uh, three or four times a year face to face. Uh, but it's not a lot of traveling. It's mostly just like we're doing here, fully interactive. Uh, anyway, anyway uh, uh, let's take a question or two and then we'll ring off for the day. I got, I got one. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, I just re I've been in business for 11 years and we were with member solutions forever since the beginning and I'm just recently in the process of transferring off of them um, over to Zen planner I like the software I like the tool for keeping track of students I haven't had anything like that before and I've always liked member solutions because they were the bad guy if anybody had a billing problem just call member solutions so I'm kind of nervous about taking on that new role of handling all that do you have any advice am i making a mistake what do you think yeah you know i i i uh, i met joe gallia when he was a program director for joyce santa maria uh and uh, uh we've been working with joe gallia and jeff cohen on uh, another little software project they're doing that does text messaging and stuff um the the answer to that scott is this is it used to be where I don't care if it's ASF, Member Solutions, EFC, um, um, YK Kim's company, all these guys are friends of mine. It used to be where the billing company was an effective bad guy that you could direct people to. And what I have found is, especially since the uh, financial crisis, is one, they're less willing to be that way. Two is the merchant account structure and the EFT structure has made it more difficult for them to be that way, to give them uh, uh, some leniency in the, in the judgment. What we know at this point is, if somebody is active and they like you, if they have a financial gap, they'll try to figure it out and put you at, at or near the top of the list. If somebody is inactive, no amount of a collection agency chasing them does anything but create negative Google reviews, Facebook reviews, Yelp reviews, and negative word of mouth, okay? We used to be in the situation where rarely would they go the effort of complaining to the Better Business Bureau, and the Better Business Bureau was just a protection racket anyway, so if you were paying the Better Business Bureau, they would still speak nicely about you. The online environment has changed that as well. So my recommendation for Billy anymore is uh, 
uh, simpletuitionmanagement.com. Uh, it's a very simple um, application that does billing uh, inexpensively as possible and the, it's a very simple dedicated software that only does one thing. It handles the billing. Um, uh, we have some of our members who use, uh, who, you were, who you were saying, Perfect Mind? Zen, Zen Planner was what I was using. Yeah. yeah. We, we have a few of our clients who like Zen Planner. I think they like Zen Planner. Um, but uh, no, I don't think I would stress about going from billing company to software at this point. Okay. And anybody will tell you, I was one of the last holdouts. I, I just was always a fan of the billing companies. But they all just started sending students back saying, we can't do it, you have to talk to them. Is that the point they lost my enthusiasm for the extra 5% bump or whatever it is? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Now I will say, if somebody's an active, happy student, you have an active, nice, polite conversation about updating the credit card or whatever and you work with them. And if somebody is inactive, you never contact them first about money. I remember years ago, I was training in a Tracy school and did the same thing, dropped, dropped out and hadn't made a couple of the payments. And the first thing we ever heard about them was not about why did you miss class? It was about why haven't you made the payment? Well, that's adding pouring salt in the wound, right? Every conversation you have with a student who's not in class is about coming back to class. Every conversation you have about a student who's somewhat unhappy but attending is about getting them to be happy. And then you worry about the money behind that, right? Because mm -hmm. a happy student will try to pay you uh, and will prioritize you over a lot of things, maybe not above the car payment. They, you know, they don't want the uh, tow truck picking up the, the car, but, uh, but they will try to pay you. And an unhappy or a dropout student, no amount of sending the collection agency after them is gonna solve it nowadays. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question real quick. Um, in regards to kid classes, I don't know how all of you run um, those type of classes, but I tried to take away um, the games to make because um, the classes were scheduled for 45 minutes and I wanted to make it an hour class and I wanted to get more curriculum and more um, trying to break their habit, their training habits or tra training scars. And, uh, and it was all color belts. And um, some of the parents came, took me into the office and had threatened to um, take their child out of the school because the child was supposedly unhappy with the fact that there was no more games. So, I, you know, am I wrong for taking out the fun, I guess, for the first 10 minutes of class or do I keep that? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a short answer, Heather, but it's a, there's a longer answer. <laughs> okay, so I'm just, you know, free, free you know, uh, uh, fair warning, this isn't a comprehensive answer. Most martial arts schools try to teach too much in the first year. So okay. if in the first year you're doing anything to squeeze more stuff in, is you're probably thinking about it wrong okay you can teach as much stuff as you possibly want to teach over four or five years but that first year is about getting them to the second year okay now number two i don't care if it's child or adult if they don't have fun in class are excited when they're done wanting more you're screwing it up okay? <coughs> Now, with children, I would rather things that feel like games be skills-oriented developmental rather than just feel like playtime, you know, because parents don't want to pay $300 a month to go to romper room, right, Jim uh, Marie or whatever. They want them to be, truly be learning something developmental. But all, a bunch of the stuff that you can do physically that's developmental can be structured as in a, in a very fun way, right? So, right. so the, the short answer to that is if you're leaving them not feeling like class was fun, you screwed something up. And if you're trying to shove more curriculum in, that's not a good idea either. Okay. Um, and again, if it was black belts, it's fine. Shove as much stuff as you want. But if it's first year students, which is all you should be focused on right now anyway, is 
and number three, by the way, first year students trying to move the class from 45 minutes to an hour so you can get more stuff in is also a bad idea, right? Is you want them leaving the class wanting more. So that's not a comprehensive answer, but if kids are coming out of your class now and they're not as happy as they were before, uh, you, they should be leaving your class being happier. You know, the trend line is I had more fun in class, not I had less fun. Uh, the second thing I would say, by the way, and this is not uh, directly uh, uh, tied to your question, but I would eliminate the idea of having kids' classes. I'd have family classes and adult classes. And the, the kids' classes, you have mom, dad, uh, parents all training together in the same class. You'll have a lot more families, and you'll have a lot better retention. And it's a much easier way to get the parents than having them come back some other time at a later time and place. And that doesn't mean you don't teach, uh, even though it's a family class, you put the teen and adults over here, you put the seven to 12 here, and you put the three to six over there. Okay. You could, you could, ch you could chunk them out a lot of ways. I mean, this, this again could be a three hour, a three day seminar, right? <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but that's the short answer. Focus on, focus on 100 new students, focus on developmental material, focus on not shoving more stuff in because pretty much everybody teaches too much stuff in the first year. Um, and make sure that they leave class wanting more, not that they leave class not wanting to come back. Okay, Because if you shove more in and have them unhappy that they came to class, they won't be there in year two, three, and four. And now you're creating uh, people who permanently suck at martial arts because you tried to teach them more stuff too early. Okay. Hate to be hard, Thank you. But that's that's the uh, the honest answer, the, the short version. Any, any last question or two before we ring off? No, well, we accomplished a lot, I think. Uh, Bob's number is 720-256-0208. I'd recommend you go to that martialartswealth.com forward slash mastermind. There's uh, two additional videos that I think are very good and a, a breakdown more about how we work with schools on an ongoing basis. Again, the content that you've gotten for us is, is the, you know, the best possible. Um, other than, uh, I freely admit, we didn't edit anything. So you're getting brutal behind the scenes of what it's all about. Uh, so it wasn't the highlights. It's exactly what we do with our members. Uh, but the apology is, Without somebody looking over your shoulder and tuning and tweaking and helping go through the process, the likelihood of making dramatic improvements rather than incremental improvements is, is low. The, the ability to go from 30,000 to 90,000 or from 50,000 to 150 or even from 12 to 30, it's right there. It's, it's a simple process. We just got to turn the right dials and, and take the right steps and focus on the right things. And again, Heather, be vigilant. Nothing else matters. Forget the crop crap, forget the black belts, forget the brown belts, go add 100 new white belts and fix your white belt curriculum and then work it up from there. Roger, thank you. You bet. Everybody good, any last question? Nope, okay, That's have a great day, guys. Hopefully that was valuable for you. Love to have some feedback. And uh, call Bob if you have uh, any trouble accessing uh, those websites. Yep, absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Bye. -bye. Bye.